I do know that I sound a little funnier than normal. I, I, I was told that. And, and for, I've, I'm on day six so of, a, of a congestion. I don't have a fever, never did have. It's just something uh, strange that I got. And I went and saw the doctor Friday. And they said, well, you're not very contagious. But you just, you know, they wrote me a prescription for these drugs. And so I had to fly to Phoenix to visit somebody kind of because I needed to. And even though I wasn't feeling well, but I you know, checked it all out with them. They were fine. But I had this vision that when I was at the airport, they were going to have me open my carry-on bag. And in the top of the carry-on bag, there was a sack full of eight prescription medication bottles. And I was going to say, you know, excuse me, where are, those are all mine. Yeah, you know, so I'm heavily medicated. I, I don't think I've ever had that many prescriptions in my name, that many different prescriptions in my entire life. I remember just looking at it going... I'm, I'm, uh, boy, something's changed. I, you know, at 61, it's different than 21. Can I get an amen? Amen. So things are different. But today, uh, I'm excited to share with you, and I'm, I'm excited to share with you a message that the Holy Spirit gave me while I was, you know, down in Phoenix. And the title of it is, is, it's this. It's Ask Him, God, to Show Them. And who is the them? The them is the people that we encounter. And it's, it's from the Gospel of John, and it's from the 14th chapter. And so if you would, you know, open up your Bibles or your phones or however, and go to John 14, 4. And in, in John, that whole section of 14, 15, 16, uh, it's a long uh, recording of Jesus' sermons to his disciples at the end of his life. And it is a transference. It, it, is, a, it is a preparation of, of them for the next phase of the relationship they're going to have with, with Christ and with God the Father. And what Christ is doing is he's, he's, he's moving them from seeing themselves as companions to co-laborers. All right? Say the, say the word companion. Nothing wrong with being a companion. I love the, the old hymn, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus you guys know that? You know, you know, it's a great, great hymn. But, but, but the truth is, he doesn't want us just to be friends. He wants us to be co-laborers. And in order to do that, there has to be a shift in how we, we see ourselves and how we see the relationship we have with God. And so with that kind of setting up this passage, uh, I, I want to start in John 14, 4. And Jesus says this. He says, and you know to where I'm going. It's a positive affirmation. And he's talking about he's getting ready to die. And there on Thomas, you know, popularly known as Doubting Thomas, pipes up and he says, uh, no, we don't, Lord. <laughs> Thomas says, we have no idea where you're going. And, and so how can we know the way? And I mean, it, it's a very human response. I mean, Jesus is talking about this and, and, and Thomas goes, you know, what, what are you talking about? You know, we're, we're here in Jerusalem, you know, where we know that the people want to arrest you, but, but you act like, you know, we have some prior knowledge. And so it, it, it's, it's indicative of this change that has to happen in how we interpret the teachings of Christ. Because, you know, if you interpret them on just a surface level, you end up struggling with some really deep spiritual truth. Things like, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. Did that freak the disciples out? Of course it did. This is the same thing. There's a spiritual discernment that we all have to embrace if we want to step from just being companions to being co-laborers. It's, it's a maturity thing that happens. And so, he goes on from there, okay, because he's going to make it clear that, that where he is going is where he came from, which is he's going back to the Father. And so Jesus in verse 6 told him, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And if you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, again, think about it on the surface level. We've never seen your dad. Joseph's been dead by historical you know, accounts for a long time. Who's he talking about? You know, what's going on here? You have to read this through a spiritually mature lens. Now, Philip chimes into the conversation. This is Philip the evangelist. And he gets it, okay, that, that Jesus is talking about God the Father. And he pipes in and he says this. He says, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Now, what, what, what is that all about? Well, I'll tell you what I think it is. It's just my opinion. I think it fits the, the text. What Phillips is, is he's clued in that Jesus is going back to the Father. 
But what he says is they don't have to really go with Christ. You know, you don't really have to take us with you. If, if you could just kind of introduce Father God to us, we'd be good with that. Could, could we just kind of have a theophany the way that Abraham did and Isaac and Jacob or maybe Moses up on Mount Sinai? Do, you know, do we have to? I don't know, because what you're talking about is a, is a step beyond. We, we don't need to go that far. We're good. Just introduce us to your dad. And, and that, well, you know, that seems like a humility kind of a process. We don't need to be all that. But this is how Jesus replies to that. I have, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? I mean, you, you claim to be a companion, but you don't really know me? Interesting. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And so, why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Now, this is part of the origin of the Trinitarian doctrine, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. You know, I don't want to get into that. We are Orthodox and are Trinitarian, but, but I want to repeat this. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but the Father, this is, this is what I wanted to highlight. The Father who lives in me does his work through me. Okay? Just believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. The Father who lives in me does his work through me. There, there's an implication in this, that, that the reason you've seen the Father is you've seen the Father's work being accomplished in my life. And that, that's what, you know, I'm showing you God by allowing God to use my life, okay? And by, by, by yielding to the leading of the Holy Spirit and leading to the, you know, yielding to the will of the Father. You know, it, it's that surrender that you sing about, Bree. That song fits very well into the context of this whole passage that we're talking about. You know, and Jesus takes it another step, though. And he tells him this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Now, again, put that together with the rest. Anyone who believes in me, who believes that, that I am from the Father, anyone who believes that I, that, that I am Christ the Lord, is going to allow God to accomplish his will through their life. If they really understand who Christ is. And even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So the Son, S-O-N, can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. That is an amazing promise. I mean, I, that... that that, it, when you pull back from it and say the creator of heaven and earth became God incarnate, you know, the, the, you have Christ, you know, the Lord, has just extended to you an invitation to ask him for anything and he will do it. But what does it mean to us in the context, I believe, of what he's talking about, which is moving from being a companion to a co-laborer? You know, how does... A co-laborer, how would a co-laborer with Christ ask God for things? Or what would they ask God for things? Or what things would they ask for? Well, most people, let me just say this. Most people will never have a Damascus Road theophany with Christ the way that Paul did. You, you know the story of the road to Damascus and, you know, he, bright light and, you know, and it says, you know, Paul, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? You know, the, the, that whole story. You know, it's an amazing example. And Paul, you know, who are you, Lord? I don't know who you are. And he said, I'm Christ Jesus, whom you've, you've been persecuting. That's an unusual account. Very few people in their life will, will have that invitation to have that kind of an encounter with God. What they will have are encounters with people like us, people who believe that Jesus is Lord. Okay, that's the encounter most of the unsaved world will have. And the question that I would ask us as we make that journey from companion to co-laborer is in those encounters, what or who 
will they see? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because the Father accomplishes his will through my life, through my works. If we believe that God is working his will through us, they will not just see us. They will see Jesus and the Father through us, through the works they see us do. And with that understanding, let's consider what Jesus is inviting us to do when he says, you will ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Again, ask him to do what? To reveal himself through our lives. Would you reveal Christ in me, the hope of glory, to the people that I interact with? And I always, I, I always have this, this weird feeling sometimes of, of, did I say the right thing or do the right thing when I have a conversation with somebody, whether it's waiting in the airport line or what else. You know, and I wonder, you know, because you don't always want to be that kind of super spiritual, weird Christian, because I don't think that's what Jesus did. And I, I think we try to kind of make up God so that we, you know what I'm saying? We act in a certain way to try to pretend because we don't know how we feel it. But, but I, 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 you know, I don't necessarily know what that looks like all the time, but I want people to, to see God through me. Should we ask him then perhaps to help us to clothe the naked and feed the hungry? If they see us doing those acts, are they seeing God in us? If we ask him to heal and deliver the broken of body and soul, um, there's a tremendous amount of information out there now about this, this crazy epidemic of mental health that is just permeating our nation. People struggling with depression, anxiety, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress, trauma in general has become a huge buzzword because of the number of people who just find it so debilitating to, you know, hindering them from experiencing life to the fullest the way that Christ would have us have. If we ask him, you know, God, reveal yourself through me, bring justice to the weak. There is this sense in the Old and the New Testament that the, the, the strong people, people of faith, stand up for what's right. And we protect those who can't protect themselves. Teach us to love unconditionally. There's a challenge. I mean, most of us, if we're honest, we don't particularly love people who aren't nice to us. No amens in the house. I mean, you know, it's, I, I, I love them. You know, I forgive them. No, you don't. You, you may forgive them, but you don't love them. I mean, when you read what love is, I mean, no, I don't have any of those feelings towards that person or these people. But that's hard. But when we can love unconditionally, is that not asking God to manifest through us? to reveal and deliver people from the oppressions of the enemy. God, help me to, to identify and deliver those folks who have been f caught up and don't know how they can get free. <sighs> Let's ask him to show them Jesus by showing them God working through us. Let's ask him to show them. And that's my nugget and my encouragement for this morning, that each of us, in some way, we would think about what Christ was talking about when he invited them to evoke the name or invoke the name of Christ and to ask God for anything, because he would give it to us so that God could work his will through us and so that the world would have an encounter with Christ by having an encounter with us. Father, I just pray. I pray for all those who are watching online that, that all of us would be encouraged that you do desire us to, to move and to, and to speak and to act and to do your will in our generation. And that, that we really are like Christ if we'll just let ourselves be. Uh, that people can see us and then they'll have seen the Father. Help us, God, to, to walk in the, the simplicity of that truth but then in, in the radical transformation that, that that truth brings to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hi there, I'm Pastor Reese Bowling, the lead pastor here at Encounter Church, and you've been watching one of our Wednesday night encouragement messages. And I pray that it was a blessing to you. I also want you to know that, that if you'd like to become a part of a church fellowship, maybe you don't have a church home right now, 
Uh, we are not only an online community, but we're also an in-person community. Our in-person services are at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings, right here at the Encounter Church location, 6825 Galena Street in Centennial, Colorado. Uh, in addition, we want to make available to you resources that would be a blessing to you. And you can contact us about those resources simply by emailing us at ec at ecdenver.org or calling the church office at 303-771-0202. But I do want to speak to a very particular group of people who are watching this right now. Maybe you're someone who has never actually asked Jesus to become your personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you've never gone to God and saying, God, I, I really, I, I, I'm sorry for how I've been living my life. I want to change. I believe in Jesus and, and I want him to, to not only forgive me, but I want him to lead me and to help me make better decisions. And if that's you I'm talking to right now, I want you to know that that transformation, that moment in your life is critical to your future. And if you haven't made that decision yet, all you have to do right now is wherever you're watching this or listening to this, just pray this prayer. Say, dear God, I believe in you and I believe in Jesus. And I know I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I want to change. And I, I want not only your forgiveness for the things I've done wrong, but I want to make you my Lord and Savior. I, I want to move forward following you. And I ask for your help. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, uh, I'm excited for you because I know that God is about to do some great things in your life. And we'd also like to partner with you on this, this new journey in Christ. And to do that, again, all you need to do is email us at ec at ecdenver.org and just tell us what happened. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you in person or online here at Encounter Church Denver.